the melt the runoff water could carry it for sure. Other? What's the ground? Is it absorbing water and water is infiltrating through it in the winter? Frozen. So the purpose of this slide is to suggest that in the winter, it is the best management practice not to land apply, particularly on slopes of any kind. But our best management practice in New Hampshire is not to land apply and spread manure or compost in the winter. Ground is frozen. We're very concerned about runoff. Um, don't have any infiltration. So we threw that slide in there. And that is, in, at times, a, it kind of goes against conventional wisdom because animals are producing manure in the winter just like they are in the summer. But we're telling you, um, and many people, it's not common sense for many people to not spread during the winter. But we're, we're saying that it's not a good management practice to, to do so. Which puts a burden on your storage facility. Because mm -hmm. your storage facility then, in theory, needs to hold six months worth of manure. Since we're not going to be land applying it in the winter. So something to consider when sizing um, a facility. Next slide. All right, you want to take this? Sure. So some of the things that we think of as contaminating groundwater, which of course is a source of some of our important drinking water in New Hampshire, um, would be nutrients from decaying plants and animals and other organic matters, pesticides, and harmful bacteria that we hear a lot about when we're hearing and reading food safety concerns, E. coli, fecal coliform, things of that nature. We do worry about getting into the groundwater. And then um, some of the potential surface water contaminants uh, all sorts of agricultural chemicals, um, mainly fertilizers, pesticides, right? Um, organic matter itself flowing right on into surface water, bacteria, nutrients, and sediment. And I think may, maybe you can picture when, when you have a highly erodible situation and at the end of very heavy rains like we're experiencing now, you'll see a great deal of sediment accumulation on the edges of, of rivers and ponds. So that is um, a source of trouble. And some things to add to this as well. Um, when we think of water quality, and as Amy said, there's actually the dissolved pollutants in the water that, that we're concerned about for drinking water quality. Um, there's also something called eutrophication. Anyone familiar with that term? Kind of a neat term. You're shaking your head. I, I believe it has something to do with the oxygen and it, the, 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 de the decaying stuff like uses up the oxygen so then living things can't use it. Did I get that right? Yeah, effectively right. What happens are there's limiting nutrients in fresh and salt water systems. In fresh water systems, the limiting, limiting nutrient is phosphorus. So phosphorus enters a fresh water system and boom, algae needs that. There's just not enough for them to, to grow. And so boom, now it's in there. They grow, they flourish, they die the natural cycle, don't descend to the bottom of that water body, and they break down. As they break down, the, micro, the bacteria consume oxygen. And as they consume oxygen, lo and behold, they're hogging it, the fish can't get it, fish kills, things to that effect. In salt water, what's the limiting nutrient? What, what causes hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico? The agricultural runoff from the Midwest. What nutrient in that runoff? Nitrogen. 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 Yep. So freshwater phosphorus, saltwater nitrogen. But so again, same system. Land applied material entering uh, a surface water system. Again, nitrogen is the limiting nutrient in the saltwater systems. Phosphorus the limiting nutrient in the freshwater system. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a couple of examples that you hear these term, this term non-point source pollution very often, I think. So an example of point source pollution, the opposite, would be just an oil spill that happens directly in a body of water. That's point source pollution. It happens right where, the same spot where it contaminates something. An example of non-point source pollution would be <clears throat> that weed and feed that I mentioned is applied to a lawn and heavy rains come along and they wash the nitrogen in the weed and feed right down into the groundwater and wash the pesticides off into surface water. And then the accumulation of a neighborhood's worth of fertilization and pesticide spreading may show up in a neighboring tributary or may show up in the groundwater of that community. So those are a couple of examples of the two different types of pollution. Okay. So 
Dick talked about the best management practices that New Hampshire um, has come up with. It's a group of people from the Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, DES, our Department of Environmental Services, um, UNH Agricultural Experiment Station, and UNH Cooperative Extension wrote the original. Yep, and so, but they're published through our Department of Agriculture. And basically, the BMPs just are that which you were handed the yellow copy or it's a document that will help to minimize water pollution um, by agriculture. One of the interesting things is how the science is always uh, evolving. It used to be when I was in grad school that phosphorus was specifically attached to soil and if you kept soil in place it was not a problem with phosphorus causing um, surface water contamination. Now we find that phosphorus is actually far more soluble, meaning it dissolves in water and can percolate into the ground or be carried in surface runoff far more than we ever thought before. So that influences how we manage the land for more environmentally sound methods. It sure does. And some of the people that Seth and I are educating are twice our age. And um, when they were at UNH, they learned that phosphorus does not move. It stays put forever. And now we're telling them that it does move, and they need to be very concerned about it. And they're not believing us. <laughs> and some of the uh, fertilizer salesmen do not believe us and do not want the farmers to believe us. So they're giving contradictory information. Over time, if someone is land applying compost or manure, and that's their main source of nutrients for their farm, that phosphorus level can be humongous, so you have to manage for that. I think we can skip ahead. Okay. So we, we spoke about the constructed facilities. Um, a lot of science in the thickness of walls, what materials can be used in manure storage facilities. Um, a lot of acids are produced that eat away cement. Um, so really recommend. Uh, we, we have. A, John Porter, who serves as the de facto ag engineer, NRCS, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They not only design, but they also will help fund. We have a handout that has NRCS's, what's called EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentive Program. <coughs> and what they do is all the practices that they will fund for, for farms are listed there. You can contact the number. They're in, um, they're in dual county areas. Actually, I think Grafton County has their own. Sullivan County shares with Chester County and Walpole. If you don't know um, the NRCS office, you can Google it, or you can call Extension or the Department of Ag. Um, Amy spoke about soil testing for nutrient levels. Two key things. A soil test, pretty darn cheap. If you want just the pH alone, it's $5. If you want your general nutrients, it's 12 And if you want your nutrients and your organic matter content, it's 17 So not an expense. And it'll tell you what are the nutrients available to your plants um, in the soil. And what, would you, what should you add if you want to get an economic yield return, which means not the highest yield at all possible by throwing everything in the kitchen sink at it, but economically, what's going to give you the greatest yield? So what nutrients are in there? pH is really important. Nutrients can be in the soil, and they're going to change all different forms, really based on the pH of the soil. Oftentimes, if we're growing fruit or vegetable, well, let me change it. If we're growing vegetables, it's fairly safe to say 6.2 to 6.8. If we're growing fruit that are non-acid loving fruit, like apples and pears, again, 6.2 to 6.8. Growing blueberries or cranberries, that's a whole different ballgame. Blueberries, we're looking at four, four, five, four, eight, the highest. So this chart kind of shows that. Well, what it shows is basically how available the thickness of each bar shows the relative availability of that element or nutrient at different soil pHs. So <clears throat> you can have, let's just say, five pounds of nitrogen in a volume of soil, and if the soil pH is only four, that nitrogen, even though that five pounds of nitrogen is there, is not available, it's not a, in a plant available form that the plant can use. But if that soil pH is somewhere from mid five up to nine, then, which we never see here, uh, then that nitrogen is as available as it's ever gonna get to that plant. What soil amendment raises pH? What do you add to a soil to raise its pH? Say your pH is six. 
begins with an L and with Line. a D. Nice. <laughs> what would you use to?